Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Evita Oshel and joining me today is special guest Dr. Friedman Schaub. Hello Dr. Friedman. Hello, thank you for having me on your program. You're very welcome and thank you for taking the time to join us today as we will be talking about your work and some of the fascinating research that you have been doing when it comes to the field of fear and anxiety. So before we begin, I will just share with the audience a little bit more about yourself. Uh, Dr. Friedman has a medical degree with a specialty in cardiology and a doctorate in molecular biology. His research has been published and featured in national and international medical and science journals, and he is also trained in numerous mind-body methods, including NLP and hypnosis. And his latest work is his book, The Fear and Anxiety Solution, a breakthrough process for healing and empowerment with your subconscious mind. And again, this will be the focus of our topic for today as both fear and anxiety and everything that stems from that, like worry and depression, are so prevalent for everyone on, on one level or another. And we're going to see how we can address these and really get to the root of healing them with and through the subconscious mind. So to begin with, I know you've had a fascinating journey because for the first part of your career, you were a typical medical doctor. And after about 15 years, you became more interested in the role and the power of thoughts, beliefs, emotions, and our self-healing abilities. And of course, this led to a whole new journey for you. Can you share a little bit with us about this transformational moment for you? Well, you know, for me, it was uh, not necessarily the light bulb going off and uh, feeling like, yeah, now, Eureka, I found the solution. It was more like a gradual process, and it led me from medicine first to research. And that was really a, a pivotal time for me because research showed me something that medicine didn't show me, which was that we all have unlimited potential inside of us. You know, when I was working on single cells and we treated them with all different kinds of methods and realizing that these single cells can adapt and heal themselves and uh, learn and grow, at some point it was very clear that every single cell has some kind of wisdom, some kind of intelligence innately within itself. And so I wondered how come that we haven't really tried harder to connect to that. What can we do to really tap into this cellular wisdom, into this innate healing power? And that's when I became very interested in the mind-body connection. I became interested in the power of our thoughts and our beliefs and our emotions in both ways, how they can actually create health challenges. And we know this about, you know, especially stress, anxiety, and so on but also how our thoughts, beliefs, and emotions can help us to heal. Mm. And, you know, I always find it remarkable and so beneficial whenever any expert or medical doctor looks at that other side or that whole complete picture as I like to see it, because it is, it's so powerful for us in terms of our healing and potential. So when we speak and we'll be talking a lot about fear and anxiety, people in the audience might be wondering, okay, well, are they the same thing? Is one rooted out of the other? Can you just summarize a little bit? How are they the same or different? How should we understand fear or anxiety? You know, in my book and in my work, I actually take them all together in one pot. There is definitely, you know, a difference when you look into the, you know, dictionary, what is fear and what is anxiety. But not everybody actually explains their emotions according to the dictionary. Mm -hmm. They often describe fear because that's the word that they have been associating their emotions with, and they, you know, others feel more comfortable saying what I'm feeling when I'm worried, or when I'm wondering whether I get fired or whether my kids are not coming home. That's anxiety. So, I believe that the emotions, fear and anxiety, come from the same source, follow the same patterns, and therefore, really, it's not necessarily so important to distinguish between them. And if you feel, you know, as a as a listener more comfortable saying, well, you know, I don't have fear, but I do have anxiety, then that's what you need to focus on. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great explanation. And, you know, I'm sure anybody who's listening and all of us have 
if we look at our examples from our own life, so many of the fears or anxieties in our lives are so unfounded. And yet we feel like, you know, we're so connected to them. Now we're rational, reasonable human beings. Why can't we just talk ourselves out of them? That's a really good question. And uh, that's actually also one of those things I was wondering at the beginning of my work, because I used to be a very stressed and anxious person. And I definitely tried when I was in medical school or in, you know, as a, as a physician where I worked in a very high powered, stressed uh, clinic and job. Why can I not just reason myself out of it? Why can I not just say, you know, I have done this many times, there's nothing to worry about? Didn't work. Well, and the reason is that words and these rational thoughts don't really reach that source of our emotions, and that source is our subconscious mind. And our subconscious mind, the deeper part of the mind, does only understand words when they're associated with the language of the subconscious and, and the language of feelings, our inner visualizations, images, our sounds and sensations. Mm -hmm. And a very cut and dry rational thought just doesn't go down there. It's uh, it's like if you know you would be nervous and I would talk German to you, unless you understand German, I wouldn't be able to comfort you because you wouldn't really understand what I'm actually saying. But if you would feel the energy, if you would feel the calmness, if you would feel some positive energy behind it, it wouldn't matter what language I speak, you would feel, okay, there's actually a positive energy with it. And that's what we need to understand if we try to, let's say, counterbalance anxious thoughts, we have to bring an energy with it. We have to bring some emotions with it. And in the book, I explain how you can do this even when you're completely stressed out. Hmm. Fascinating. And I love to hear, you know, that bringing in that source of energy because, again, the more, the more we study, the more we look inside of ourselves, outside of the world, we do see that truly everything comes down to energy and, and how that impacts our life. Now, in your book, you also say that emotions are what determine our life experience. How can we understand them a little bit better? Because you've also mentioned their importance here. Well, I think emotions are basically what makes life not only interesting, but what makes life memorable. I mean, we all know that certain things stick out in our past, and they don't stick out because it was something you know, on paper memorable. It was something usually that sticks out that was really giving us a good feeling. I was thinking the other day of an event when I was 15 years old and I was laying in the grass somewhere in southern France, two beautiful 15-year-old girls next to me and I was <laughs> looking up to, you know, the roof of leaves above me and I told myself, that's a nice moment. I'm going to remember this forever. And now, you know, 33 years later, I'm still remembering this moment. And, and that it's not really, a, you know, a, a something exciting that happened, but the emotion makes that moment really that what sticks out. And, and so when we go through the daily, uh, you know, daily work or the daily life that we have, we know that whatever we have as an emotion on that day will shape the experience. You can wake up with the wrong foot and you just feel everything's going to go wrong. Everything may go well, but you still feel it was a lousy day. Mm -hmm. And you may be freshly in love and everything is so beautiful and maybe you have really bad experiences, but it doesn't really matter because you're so happy and in love and that's what matters. So emotions are very, very powerful. The problem is just... Most people don't know, how can we control our emotions? Wouldn't it be nice if I could actually in the morning wake up and say, okay, today I'm going to program myself for bliss. How would that be? That's where the challenge is that, you know, we need to learn how to actually work with our emotions and not just try to ignore them. Mm, powerful stuff. And, you know, I'm sure it doesn't help that most of us in our society today get brought up from an early age by being taught to suppress our emotions and not really show them and not pay attention to them. And then we, you know, deal with the things we deal with as adults, right? Now, something else that you also, um, I thought, explains so well in your book, and I think what we need is that you don't 
show or explain as fear and anxiety as, you know, enemies or problems, but as information and as a guiding system, really, that is there to show us when something is out of balance, which I thought, you know, really nice so that we're not making an enemy out of a part of ourselves. But what else is very important, I think, that you share so much in the book is how when we sort of don't listen to this guidance system, or if it goes on overdrive, it becomes too sensitive. And I thought, you know, this is a fascinating area that most people don't realize. Can you talk a little bit about this? Well, I think, you know, in some ways you could say it's like pain. You know, let's say you do have a cavity and you're simply ignoring the cavity because maybe you're afraid of the dentist. Well, at some point, this pain going to knock a little bit more on mm -hmm. your door, on your jaw, and at some point, it will be inevitable for you to do something about it. Now, the way we often deal with emotions, especially anxiety, depression, or emotions that we call negative emotions, is to suppress them. We take medication, we try to self-medicate, we try to ignore them, or like, you know, we talked about rationalize them, but we don't necessarily listen to them. And so when we are ignoring anxiety, when we are not paying attention to our fears, they will get bigger as if, you know, this messenger is screaming a little bit louder and is saying, okay, pay attention to me. You're not really paying attention to me. That's one scenario that shows you that these uh, anxieties have a purpose and they cannot be ignored. Now, another scenario that's very common is that we are anxious and rather than looking inside, what's actually going on inside of me? What's out of balance within me? We are looking on the outside. So we're trying to control the circumstances, controlling the husband, the wife, the kids, the money, whatever those things are. And by believing if I can control the circumstances, if I can control and micromanage my life, there will be no anxiety. We are actually creating more anxiety because we are realizing we cannot really control life. We cannot control the details. And that, you know, pattern or that uh, coping mechanisms, you know, doesn't really work out. So that creates even a greater sense of, oh my God, I am powerless now in this face of anxiety. And and really we have to turn, like you said so nicely, our our awareness and our belief towards these emotions around and really honor them as messengers and information that needs to be first and foremost listened to and then understood and then addressed and then we can see this actually that similar to pain the emotions tell you there's something for you to heal there is something for you to actually grow from to learn and by doing so you actually will at the end and that happens you know always when i work with clients you will actually be grateful for it you will actually realize thank you for for giving me this information anxiety because without it I would have actually not understood more who I am or which direction my life should go or what I need to change in order to find more balance. Mm -hmm, very much so. And it hits on something so critical that you said about looking at the external and that's so true. We think that maybe the next relationship or maybe the right job or, or you know, winning the lottery or whatever the case may be will solve our problems, will make the worries, the anxiety, the fear go away. But it's really everything, whether we're medicating, whether we're seeking that external situation, it's just surface level stuff. We want to get to the root. And this is where your work really, really starts to get and help us understand how can we tap into that language of the subconscious mind to actually get somewhere. So to, you know, get a little bit deeper into that, you also explain that there are important relationships between the self-limiting ideas, the negative self-talk that we have, the self-fulfilling prophecies. How do these sort of play into the anxiety and fear that we experience and create for ourselves? Being a researcher, I think, really helped me to dissect an emotional and kind of uh, obscure you know, topic, uh, fear and anxiety, and, and look for how do we actually do that? You know, we, we are, if we understand how we do something, we can actually also undo it or change. But if we are just saying, I want to get rid of it, usually whatever we are resisting persists, we know that. So just dissecting more and observing more, how do we create anxiety, brought me to understand that most of our anxieties are actually anxieties we have talked ourselves into. 
And what that means is that you can wake up in the morning and you may feel anxious. And in that moment, you think, oh, the anxiety attacks me. It's right there, waiting behind the bed, jumps on me, and mm. again, I'm feeling anxious. But the truth is, you probably had a thought right before this anxiety, a thought about, oh, I don't want to go to work. And these thoughts may be so fast, you know, from, I don't want to go to work. There may be another thought that says, well, but you have to go to work because you have to pay the bills. And then there may be a thought, oh, I will never pay the debt off. I can never afford something. What if I'm going to lose my job? My boss was just, you know, frowning at me the other day. Probably you want to fire me. So there is a cascade of fast, negative thoughts that can appear almost on a subconscious level, like under the radar of the conscious mind that can bring us in seconds into a state of anxiety. And all we feel is the anxiety and we don't really notice how we got there. Mm -hmm. And so when you actually are observing your thoughts during the day, you will see, I actually talk myself into being anxious or afraid quite often. I'm actually using a lot of what if assumptions or I'm very self-critical or I take a lot of things personally, all things that create anxiety. And, and when you notice this, you can also see that there is a spiral that then occurs. And what's fun, actually, for anyone to do, just to write those thoughts down, five a day, just five random negative thoughts that you know, oh, that triggers my anxiety. And you will notice usually they repeat themselves over and over again. The themes are usually the same. The themes don't really change. I just talked to a, a new client today, and he said, you know, I have thousands of negative thoughts, but there are only two themes. One is I'm not good enough, and the other one, I cannot trust people. I mean, that's basically all there is and for this person. And so just understanding, usually my negative thoughts, even though they appear multiple in my, in my mind, they actually point down to a theme, and that theme is one of the root causes, one of those three root causes I identified for uh, fear and anxiety, which is the limiting core beliefs. And what that means is basically the belief of what we are, who we are, and what the world is about, which are very early instilled into our mind. And, and the thoughts can point out to those beliefs and make you realize that's really something I need to work on. Yeah, and thank you for, you know, sharing that to motivate us to keep looking deeper. And what also I thought was fascinating as you're talking about, you know, these beliefs that we make up and the ideas is you also share in your book that really the view most of us have of reality is basically made up. That's a pretty powerful thing because so many of us are so focused and convinced that, you know, this is reality. But what we each experience is, as you're saying, pretty much made up. Well, actually, I just have a, a blog article on Huffington Post about that. Can we choose our reality? So check it out. I'm always happy for people to read it and like it. But what it is basically is that when we do have a, a perspective on anything, there is so much information coming in that we would be completely overwhelmed if we would take everything in. I mean, I see a beautiful room behind you. But I wouldn't be able, if I would close my, mind, uh, my eyes, really tell every little detail because that would be too much. And that happens all the time. There are billions of bits of information coming to us. And in order for us not to get a fried brain, we have to obviously have some way of filtering out that information that seems pertinent and imp important and let the you know, information go through or, you know, run by that is not important to us. And those filters are subconscious filters. Let's say you grew up in an environment that was very instable, you know, mother, father, alcoholics fighting all the time. And you basically have as a filter that whenever there is a loud voice, you immediately need to, you know, duck or run away or just, you know, brace yourself in the future, no matter where you are, you may be at the airport and somebody is, you know, screaming after their child because it's running away. In that moment, this old anxiety will come up because that's the filter that you hear this voice through. If there is a filter of, oh, I have been criticized many times, I'm not really good enough. Whenever there is only the slightest little, you know, I have sometimes people telling me, I'm not good enough, and I notice it when I go to the coffee shop because I always feel 
that the barista ignores me or she gives me the wrong drink or I'm not really respected. That's not something that other people would notice, but because this person is sensitized to not feeling good enough and expecting that you know people treat her accordingly, that's what she interprets her reality as. Mm. So in other words, reality is not real. It's really an interpretation. And so you are not really really aware of who you are. You're just seeing an interpretation that you allow yourself to have. And the beauty about it is there is so much more for each and every one of us to discover. There is so much more for us to actually realize about ourselves and and to say, well, if I remove this filter and let go of the I'm not good enough filter, and then maybe also let go of the filter of I cannot do this or I cannot have what I want, my good what could life be really like? And that's really the exciting part about working with the subconscious. Oh, I would say so. My goodness, I love what you just shared. And, you know, it's hopeful, it's powerful, and it shares with all of us that we have the potential to heal really anything and really let go, release, integrate fully the best of ourselves. And and like I said, open up this potential of what could reality really be like? So let's shift in our last part to really addressing the healing and the treatment. We've got the negative self-talk, we've got the self-fulfilling prophecies, the self-limiting beliefs, all these different subconscious filters. You share that part of the healing involves a collaboration between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. Can you speak a little about this? Yeah, I think it's very important that the conscious mind and the subconscious are integrating and working together and what that means is that we have to consider the subconscious mind as an extremely powerful and potent servant it is really here to serve us the subconscious mind doesn't have an agenda on its own it only has two basically you know passions or motivations which is to keep us safe and to make us happy now, how do we learn those you know, strategies to keep us safe, for example? That's what we learn early in our lives. You know, sometimes people feel, I actually learned to hide out when I was a baby, or I learned to really watch out for danger when I was in the womb. This can happen very, very early in our lives. This doesn't have to be something conscious. The problem is that the subconscious continues with those protective strategies until it is told this is no longer necessary you can actually change it you can let go of that and that's where the conscious mind comes in so the subconscious mind is like the in in some ways a director it needs to be the guide for the subconscious to actually show up and say you know life has changed you're not this little boy or little girl anymore you can actually see the world and yourself differently and then the subconscious is very willing to learn and to grow and in the book and in my work I'm showing people how to do this you know for example many people that are anxious have an inner conflict and what that means is that there is a part of them that feels you know like an adult wants to be successful wants to go and uh, you know go into a relationship have uh, a self-fulfilled life then there is the other part That is the opposite. That's the part that holds them back. They call it the inner critic, the saboteur, the weakling, the anxious side, the part that always somehow says no. That part is connected to anxiety. Now, what happens is that we are constantly in a tug of war. You know, a part of us says, let's move forward. Another part reels us back in. And that inner conflict, I know a lot of people can relate to that, of course, makes you always feel out of balance and uneasy. And you want to just get rid of this part of you that seems to hold us back. But the truth is that part, that's that inner protector that at some point in your life saw it necessary for you in order to make it through life, to take on certain strategies of protection, like becoming invisible or being always perfect or pleasing everyone. Those strategies will continue to repeat themselves and also continue to make you feel anxious as you know as a result of it if you always have to be perfect or if you always feel like you have to be invisible that creates anxiety 
until you consciously are working with that part, and there is a process described in the book, the parts integration process, that helps you then to understand this part, to directly communicate with this part, to discern what are actually the, the gifts of this part, and what are the old patterns and the behaviors that no longer serve you, and then really reintegrate this part into your wholeness. This is a process that you cannot do intellectually. You cannot just read through the pages and say, oh yeah, that's done now because I got it. You really have to experience it on a, on a subconscious and also on an energy level. And that's a really amazing part of this process that you feel as if they're an internal zipper closing you up and you feel all of a sudden there is a centeredness and the wholeness that you may have never experienced before. And that's what the conscious subconscious uh, collaboration can do. It can really bring all of your subconscious into the now, up to date, and no longer stuck in the past. Mm -hmm. So in order to heal, we need to definitely look at the root level. We need to learn about the language of the subconscious bridge that collaborative effort between the conscious and the subconscious mind and as you shared there's the integration process that also you share about helping us understand how to get to the root with the emotions with the energy present etc now of course a lot of people might be thinking okay uh, it sounds great i really really want to heal but you don't understand i don't have the time to you know read the book never mind then actually take the time to really apply it what advice do you have to them well, you know, the beauty about this book and the work is it's very much a step-by-step -step process, and it's up to you how big of a step you want to take. Every step along the way will change you. Mm -hmm. Every step along the way is a healing because you're moving forward. So whether you're at the beginning reading through the first 20 pages and just understand, ah, this is how I create anxiety. That's what it's really about. And then you move forward and understand, oh, that's the subconscious wow, now I actually understand. That's not just something obscure. There is actually a lot of power behind it. And then you move to setting goals for yourself and finally looking beyond the wall of anxiety and realizing I can actually imagine a much better life, building motivation. You know, all those things you can take a day, you can take a week and take a month. It doesn't matter. Many people that start just setting goals. This is something that I often do with my clients, say that their change started in the moment when they imagined themselves outgrown and beyond the anxiety patterns of the past. The subconscious, all, it's, the analogy I always tell people is when you're wanting to buy a house, all of a sudden you see for sale signs popping up everywhere. Because you have given your subconscious a direction, I want to buy a house, look for for sale signs. Or, you know, I, I remember I was madly in love in a, with a beautiful woman, and she was in Germany, I was in New York. I saw her all over the place. Of course she wasn't in New York, but that's my subconscious was looking for that, what I desired. And that's what the subconscious does. So if you are desiring peace or confidence or specific situations to handle them much better and you can imagine it and you can try to feel how that would be, your subconscious will help you to get there. And then you just take your time, go through the steps. This book is not about fast read that you just want to get through. There are tons of exercises and really wonderful solidifying homework with it. And it really helps you to build something new. You know, one of the aspects, you just beautifully lined out the process, but at the end of the, of the, the last chapter of the book is actually about rebuilding. And this is something that's often misunderstood. You know, we are thinking, well, let's get rid of that, what we don't want. Let's mm -hmm. get rid of the anxiety. But the subconscious doesn't like to have the void. It likes to fill it. It likes to have something instead of it. So, if we just want to let go of anxiety and we are not replacing it with something, we are having the tendency to go back into the old grooves because that's what the subconscious can hold on to. So we need to build a new foundation of confidence, of a greater sense of inner peace, and we need to build a new identity, a sense of this is how I can see myself becoming. This is what I want to grow into. When you do that, then as your focus, Anxiety is really just a, a little guide that nudges you at times when you have been maybe 
you know, not taking care of yourself or taking things too personally or maybe you have given your power away because you thought this goal is more important than yourself, then the anxiety may say, hey, come back in. This is not really your place. Remember, your place is staying within your center and focusing on that what you can actually create and control and let go of those other things. Then really life is so much richer and you are so much bigger because of it. Mm. So we really need to make a commitment to ourselves is what I'm hearing. And, you know, that's something that definitely can propel us, that motivation which you also speak about in your book and that commitment can propel us forward on this journey and really make it stick. Because if there's one thing that I find always so unfortunate is how so many people go through their entire life never healing their anxieties, never healing these past patterns and mind conditioning from the subconscious that not just doesn't serve them, but sabotages so severely their life quality. And something perhaps that you can also comment on as a medical doctor is what about our physical? Because it's one thing to maybe say, ah, oh, you know, I have good days, I have bad days. But how is this anxiety and fear that we don't deal with, but sort of just try to get along one day after another and push along, impact our physical health? Oh, very much so. Absolutely. And, you know, I think there is a, there is a cascading effect. As I said, you know, the anxiety will knock at your door and will try to get your attention. And, and often it's starting with the thoughts and then mm -hmm. there are the emotions. And then, you know, people feel like, well, my whole day is basically a low-grade anxiety. But then when things don't change, it can definitely go into sleeping patterns. It can go into high blood pressure chronic pain. I remember one case very clearly, actually several cases, you know, about uh, autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. that are very, very much connected to anxiety. And uh, a young man came to me once and he had a very, um, very, very difficult time with Crohn's disease, which is an uh, inflammation of the bowel. And, uh, and he really could pinpoint down that it started with a traumatic event when he was 17, an event where he got into a fight and uh, unfortunately the guy that he was fighting with got hurt. He ran away and he felt guilty and anxious of being found out ever since. Probably nothing happened, you know. There is, in his mind it was like, oh my God, what did I do? But there was probably just his mind blowing it all up and out of proportion. But internally there was always this anxiety and this conflict for years and that created this uh, this intestinal problem and uh, he was ready to go to germany to get some special treatment for thousands of dollars and we worked on the root cause and now he doesn't have to take even medication so you know mm. you there is definitely healing possible but the healing needs to come from being actually also in a place of peace with yourself and one of the processes in the book is a pattern resolution process which is a very very powerful process of you to release the patterns and the root causes of your anxieties you're going back into your past into your childhood and even before and really understanding more from a higher perspective what is it what i need to learn what is it actually what i feel like is uh, you know the 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 root of my my anxiety and how can i see this whole event and this uh, you know these uh, chain of events differently the, the amazing thing about the subconscious is that it is a quick learner and it wants you to learn, and especially from the past. And when we do learn from the, the past, we automatically grow. And, you know, often people tell me, well, I have so much baggage of the past. And I tell them, wonderful, there's so much for you to learn. There's so much growth potential. You're lucky because when you're really able to tap into this and release the emotions, you will be a transformed person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful advice. Thank you so much. And as we wrap up, that's the last part that I really wanted to um, have you share on is really we know that we need that commitment, we need that motivation. But when we get to these different aspects and points in our life as adults, it's one thing because now we need to really take seriously this journey so that we can have a better quality of life. But what maybe several tips or, or quick advice do you have for anybody who's a parent or a guardian of younger ones, maybe, you know, young mm. children or teenagers who are so, you know, at that prime age when so much is shaping what's going to happen in terms of their future patterns? Oh, there is so much to say. I think this is, uh, you know, a whole <laughs> new topic for another show because, 
it's also dear to my heart. Yeah. You, you, you're absolutely right that we as adults need to really help our children to not repeat the same patterns. And, uh, you know, it, it's not here to blame anyone, but people that come to me as adults know I learned anxiety from my mother or my father. I picked it up from their behavior. And so it's, as a parent, really important that you say, I need to really be in a place of, of calmness and peace because whether I'm expressing my anxiety or not, my children feel it. They have a very astute awareness and they're going to somehow absorb it. And I need to turn this around, not only for my own sake, but also for their sake. But the other thing that I find is build a, for the children a sense of confidence, empowerment, but also stability. You know, what I find often is that the common denominator of, of people being anxious is that there was a confusion and an instability in the household. Now, there was a very interesting study a long time ago, but the study basically said that when people grow up in a household that was always negative and always basically critical and there was never anything positive, I'd say the, the, the father was always, you know, a scary person. It's very much easier for those people to overcome the past than when there is a confusing environment where sometimes the father is nice and then he can be violent or angry. Sometimes the mother gives great praise and then she's very critical. So that confusion of now, what am I supposed to be? Who is, you know, my mother now? What is my role in the world? That's so hard to digest and the subconscious will literally circle around this question to resolve this confusion for a very long time. And, and that's one of those roots of, uh, of anxiety. So create a stable environment, be clear about the messages that you want to give your children and try to get them out of this competitive mindset that is so prevalent in our society, where it's all about, you know, you have to compete yet already. You have to strive for college when you go into kindergarten and so on. I mean, <laughs> We really have to allow our children to unfold and not just to become perfect little soldiers and, and really basically never have a chance to discover what they actually want and what their gifts are in the world that they're here to share. Mm, outstanding. Thank you so very much for sharing that. And thank you really for everything that you've shared as well as the wonderful book, which I have no doubt will play a huge role in many people's lives and on their healing journeys. And so for anyone interested, again, they can visit your website, thefearandanxietysolution.com to learn more about you, to read some of the blog posts that you were talking about and sharing, as well as learn more about the book. And I know you also do uh, international consults with people worldwide. So of course, anybody who is drawn to work with you can also reach you through that channel as well. And I you know, would love to have you back again, because again, your work is so valuable. And especially now when I know so many people are at a time in humanity where we are more interested at really trying to get to the root of our issues and heal on a deep level. So thank you so much for sharing all that you have. Are there any other um, events or any new projects coming up that you would like to just leave us with? Yeah, we have actually a whole new um, project coming up in the fall which will be a webinar, group webinars, where people actually can uh, work in a group setting from the comfort of their own home uh, on fear and anxiety. There will be weekly webinars, and uh, you know, there's a, a whole new wave of helping people with anxiety because I really think the anxiety can be a teacher, but it can be also one of the biggest obstacles in our lives, and, uh, and freeing ourselves from that obstacle and using anxiety as a catalyst to find ourselves. That's certainly the mission and the passion that I have. And uh, I'm happy to help anyone who needs help in that. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for sharing all that. And thank you everyone for joining us. And until next time. <laughs>